So our next presenter, uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was a show called uh, Kitty A Go Go. Does anybody remember Kitty A Go Go? Wasn't that a great show? So when I, when I found uh, Chick A Go Go, I was like, wow, um, this really takes me back. She's not only the host of that show, which had a couple of WBEZers on years ago doing like lip syncing. Jerome McDonald, I think, played keyboards or something, Gretchen Helfrich. <laughs> it was great. Um, I describe Mia Park as just fun. She's always got a smile on her face. She does so many things. She's a yoga teacher, a rock musician. And I'll never forget the day I was watching television and there was a commercial, I think it was for Pace. Yeah. And I said, I know that woman. She gave a guy a dirty look who was, was he, he was driving the car. You were on the bus, yeah. So she does TV commercials as well. Here she is with the book that changed her life, Mia Park. This is like the most awesome love fest ever. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Okay, seven minutes. So, so my mother escaped from North Korea before the Korean War. And around the same time in Japan, my ethnically Korean father survived the Nagasaki bombing, the end of World War II. So respectively, my parents were child refugees to South Korea. Um, and then years later, the Korean War broke out. So during the Korean War, my mother's South Korean house collapsed on top of them, and they were in a bomb shelter for eight days. And when the communists came down to South Korea, she lived in a cave in the mountain. They ate um, rocks and uncooked rice kernels to survive. And my father, who was separated from his family, walked from Seoul to Busan. It's 205 miles. He was 11 years old. So after the war, respectively, there was a big, they came to America, big outforce uh, out of them. Korean immigrants that came to America with all this kind of cultural trauma and all this individual, unprocessed individual trauma. So my parents met and married in Philadelphia. They met in Philadelphia, three months later they were married and then all of a sudden they have this family. They desperately tried to be as American as possible to try to avoid this post-war hell in Korea, right? So then they have us, these kids. So we're raised in this house with, with these people that don't talk about this trauma, that never process their trauma. And they want nothing more than to have a normal American family. And we were the total opposite of an American normal family. Oh my God, my dad's crazy. He's crazy, he's still crazy. So, and very, very, very abusive. I grew up in an incredibly abusive household. So uh, the conflicting image of growing up in this how craziness was insane. So my dad would, um, this is where I have to go to my notes because I have so many stories. Okay, so for example, okay, my dad, one of the many things that my dad did was martial arts. So at one of the places we lived in Philadelphia, we lived upstairs from the studio, the dojang. So I started taking Korean martial art lessons in self-defense when I was three. So I would be learning the self-defense, and then when I got home upstairs, my dad would beat me using the techniques that he had just taught me, but I was defenseless. And another example of that is that um, my father refused to teach us Korean growing up because he didn't want us to have accents and he, he wanted us to assimilate. And then he would tell me to do things in Korean, and if I didn't understand them, I got beat again. It was this conflicting thing. I thought, I don't, wanna, I don't know what I'm supposed to be. So my mother, in dealing with all this chaos and violence in the house, the reason why her family fled North Korea was because they were Christian, and they were persecuted. So that carried over to her life in America. Her brothers came over. She was the first one here. Anyway, so I grew up in a very conservative Korean church in Philadelphia, the first one. And if you guys know anything about Korean Presbyterianism, I don't know if anybody here actually does, but uh, anyway, it's a really, it's so conservative. I was, oh, you do, okay. <laughs> okay, so you know, I don't, I'm gonna stop right here. I got someone who sees me, thank you. Anyway, it's crazy, because you go to this Korean church, they're all like, oh, honorim kam samnida. They're all speaking in Korean that I don't understand. And I was taught to worship this old white guy in a chair in the clouds who gave his only begotten son, who was another white guy on the earth who died for my sins because they loved me, but they weren't doing shit to help me at home. I was like, this is what it's like being Korean in America? All this, it's like that. It's like horrible things happen. You're like, what was that? It was like that every day. So church was like that. It was crazy. Okay, let me share this story. So I've always had this pursuit of being spiritual. I've always been curious about trying to make life out of chaos and cultural identity. You know, I'm questioning life. I'm like four, right? So by the time I was in middle school, in our uh, middle school Sunday school group in Korean church, 
uh, I was the only girl in this group of mostly boys. <laughs> and because I couldn't memorize my Korean Christian Bible passages because I didn't speak Korean, we would get punished. I would get punished. Right? This, is <laughs> this is how we got punished. We would go to the church gym and go to the end of the gym, and you had to bend over backwards with your legs spread. And on the other side of the gym, my Sunday school classmates had a bucket of tennis balls. I'm not kidding. And they would throw and hit you in the butt with tennis balls. Because I couldn't learn my Korean lessons because I never was raised to speak Korean. And it's like, oh my god, I get a bloody nose and it hits you in the face. And you're looking at everybody upside down and you're like, this is God? This is Korean spirituality? Amen. Okay. I got out of there as soon as I could. I got out of my house as soon as I could. I was crazy. So by the time I turned 19, um, got my first tattoo. My mom said, you're, you're not going to, oh, Mia, you, you can't get buried in Korean cemetery. I said, mom, isn't that, aren't those Jews? Do the Koreans do that too? I don't know. Just stop, stop. Anyway, so um, uh, I ended up, I started playing rock drums. I did everything I could to reject where I came from. So as a kid growing up, I would stand in the sun like, like this, because I thought if I got enough sun, I would somehow turn my black hair blonde, and I would get freckles, because blonde girls with blue eyes get freckles, and I would be American, and I would get away from everything. But as a teenager, that didn't work. I was dyeing my hair colors, I got tattooed, I started playing rock drums. I moved to Austin, Texas to start a band and like be Texan, and instead I did at least a pickup truck full of drugs at least two times a day, and I was like, I gotta get out of here. So my sister had moved to Korea, to Seoul, Korea, to get a, work on a master's degree, and she was just like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm lost in America. I don't know what I'm doing here. And she said, come, just come live with me in Seoul. And I'd been to Seoul when I was 18 and felt lost there, so I went. I went to Korea, and very ironically, in an international Korean bookstore, I found this book, Folk Art and Magic, Shamanism in Korea, by a white guy with a beard, <laughs> who's American. And I found this American book, and this book was the key to my discovering my roots and my culture, and the freedom of realizing that this guy on the cover, this is the real old school Korean god that the Western missionaries came in to try to force me to understand. But with realizing this book and understanding that Korea has a much richer, deeper, real spiritual pursuit, free Western influence, I didn't have to bend over and get hit in the ass with tennis balls in order to find my culture. So thank you very much. Wow.